Hi, hello, how are you? Now, I missed out last night, and you might be able to tell, depends what um, quality <laughs> you're watching me on. Look at my red eyes! It's real, a really, really hay fever way today, uh, where I live, and that's why I didn't come on last night. My eyes were just like <laughs> bulging out there yesterday. Oh, but here we are. I've just given my face a good wash. My window is open, but just because it's so hot in here. Should we start? I know people don't like to hang around. So, let's have some more of Terry Pratchett's I Should Wear Midnight, book four of the Tiffany Aiken series. Of course, you know that already. So, last time we were here, uh, do you remember Captain Carrot, raised by dwarfs? In, I've got to try and get this right. I haven't Revision. I haven't revised it or anything or researched it, but I seem to remember he was from a place called Claregub. Was wasn't it Claregub, or was that in? Um, that might have been in Under Milk Wood. I know it starts with a double L. <laughs> Clamedos, maybe, because it's something backwards, isn't it? Claregub is in Under Milk Wood, and Clamedos is in Discworld, where Captain Carrot dwarven parents are from then we met captain angua i let you into a secret already didn't i maybe i shouldn't have done but i mean if you've read the watch books you know don't you that captain angua is a werewolf we just know that so let's pick it up from there ready here we go captain angua shook her head sorry miss but it's true turned out to be a book of clanchian poetry you know all that wiggly writing I suppose it looks like a spell book for those inclined to think that way. She died. More pop-ups. Gone. I blame the times, said Mrs. Proust. When they put that sort of thing in a paper, it gives people ideas. Angua shrugged. From what I hear, the people who did it weren't much for reading. You've got to stop it, said Tiffany. How, miss? We are the city watch. We don't have any real jurisdiction outside the walls. There are places out there in the woods that we probably haven't even heard of, you know. I don't know where this stuff comes from. It's like there's some mad idea dropping out of the air. Oh, yes, yes, hold that thought. The captain rubbed her hands together. Of course, we don't have any witches in the city, she said. Although there are quite a lot of hen knights. Hey, Mrs. Proust. And the captain winked. She really winked. Tiffany was certain of it in the same way that she'd been certain that Captain Carrot really did not like the Duchess very much. Well, I think real witches would soon stop it, Tiffany said. They certainly would in the mountains, Mrs. Proust. Oh, but we don't have real witches in the city. You heard the captain. Mrs. Proust glared at Tiffany and then hissed, We do not argue around the normal people. It makes them jittery. They stopped outside a large building with blue lamps on either side of the doors. Welcome to the watch, ladies, said Captain Angua. Now, Miss Aching, I shall have to lock you in a cell, but it will be a clean one. No mice, hardly at all. And if Mrs. Proust will keep you company, then shall we say I might be a bit forgetful and leave the key in the lock? Do you understand? Please do not leave the building, because you will be hunted. She looked around directly at Tiffany and added, And no one should be hunted. It is a terrible thing, being hunted. She led them through the building and down to a row of surprisingly cosy-looking cells, gesturing for them to go inside one of them. The door of the cell clanged behind her, and they heard the sound of her boots as she went back down the stone corridor. Mrs. Proust walked over to the door and reached through the bars. There was a tinkle of metal and a hand came back in with a key in it. She put it in the keyhole on this side and turned it. There, she said. Now we are doubly safe. Oh, Crivens, said Rob anybody. Will you not look at us? Slammed in the banger. Again, said Daft Woolly. I did it again if I will ever look myself in me face. Mrs. Proust sat back down and stared at Tiffany. All right, my girl, what was that we saw? No eyes, I noticed. No windows into the soul. No soul, perhaps. Tiffany felt wretched. I don't know. I met him on the road here. 
The Feagles walked right through him. He seems like a ghost and he stinks. Did you smell it? And the crowd were turning on us. What harm were we doing? I'm not certain it's a him, said Mrs. Proust. He might even be an it. Could be a demon of some sort, I suppose, but I don't know much about them. Small trade retail is more my forte. Not that that can't be a bit demonic at times. But even Roland turned on me, said Tiffany, and we've always been friends. Aha, uh -huh, said Mrs. Proust. Don't you aha uh -huh me, snapped Tiffany. How dare you aha uh -huh me? At least I don't go around making witches look ridiculous. Mrs. Proust slapped her. It was like being hit with a rubber pencil. You are a rude slip of a girl, you young hussy. And I go around keeping witches safe. Up in the shadows of the ceiling, Daft Woolly nudged Rob anybody and said, We can of let somebody smack our big wee hag, eh, Rob? Rob anybody put a finger to his lips. Ah, weel. It can be a wee bit difficult with women folk arguing, you know. Keep right out of it, if you'll take my advice as a married man, that is. Any man who interferes in the arguing of women is going to find both of them jumping up and down on him in a matter of seconds. I'm nae talking about the folding of the arms, the pursing of the lips and the tapping of the feet. I'm talking about the smacking around with the copper stick. The witches stared at one another. Tiffany felt suddenly disoriented, as if she had gone from A to Z without passing through the rest of the alphabet. Did that just happen, my girl? said Mrs. Proust. Yes, it did, said Tiffany sharply. It still stings. Mrs. Proust said, Why Why did we do it? To tell the truth, I hated you, said Tiffany. Just for a moment. It frightened me. I just wanted to be rid of you. You were just... All wrong, said Mrs. Proust. That's right. Ah, said Mrs. Proust. Discord, turning on the witch. Always blame the witch. Where does it start? Perhaps we've found out. Her ugly face stared at Tiffany. Then she said, When did you become a witch, my girl? I think it was when I was about eight, said Tiffany. And she told Mrs. Proust the story about Mrs. Snappily, the witch in the Hazel Woods. The woman listened carefully and settled down on a straw. We know it happens sometimes, she said. Every few hundred years or so, suddenly everyone thinks witches are bad. No one knows why it is. It just seems to happen. Have you been doing anything lately that might attract attention? Any especially important piece of magic or something? Tiffany thought back and then said, Well, there was the hiver, but... He wasn't all that bad, and before that there was the Queen of the Fairies, but that was ages ago. It was pretty awful too, but generally speaking, I think hitting her over the head with a frying pan was the best thing I could have done at the time. And, well, I suppose I'd say, better say that a couple of years ago I did kiss the winter. Mrs. Proust had been listening to this with her mouth open, and now she said, That was all you? Yeah, said Tiffany. Are you sure? said Mrs. Proust. Yeah, it was me. I was there. What was it like? Chilly and then damp. I didn't want to have to do it. I'm sorry, all right? Excuse me. Gross. I'm sorry. About two years ago, said Mrs. Proust. That's interesting. The trouble seemed to start around then, you know. Nothing particularly major. It was just as though people didn't respect us anymore. Just something in the air, you might say. I mean, that kid with the stone this morning, well, he would never have dared try that a year ago. People always gave me a nod when I passed by in those days, and now they frown, or they make some little sign just in case I bring bad luck. The others have told me about this too. What's it been like where you are? I can't really say, said Tiffany. People were a bit nervous of me, but on the whole I suppose I was related to a lot of them, but... Everything fell odd, and I thought that was how it had to feel. I'd kissed the winter and everybody knew. Honestly, they do go on about it. I mean, it was only the once. Well, people are packed a little more closely together around here, and witches have long memories. I mean, not individual witches, 
but all the witches put together can remember the really bad times when wearing a pointy hat got a stone thrown at you, if not something worse. And when you go back further than that, it's like a disease, Mrs. Prowse said. It sort of creeps up. It's in the wind, as if it goes from person to person. Poison goes where poison's welcome. And there's always an excuse, isn't there, to throw a stone at the old lady who looks funny. It's always easier to blame somebody, and once you've called someone a witch, then you'd be amazed how many things you can blame her for. They stoned her cat to death, said Tiffany, almost to herself. And now there's a man without a soul who's following you, and the stink of him makes even witches hate witches. You don't feel inclined to set fire to me by any chance, Miss Tiffany aching? No. Of course not, said Tiffany, or press me flat on the ground with lots of stones upon me. What are ye talking about? It wasn't just stones, said Mrs. Proust. You hear people talk about witches being burned, but I don't reckon many real witches ever did get burned unless they were tricked in some way. I think it was mostly poor old women. Witches are mostly too soggy, and it was probably a wicked waste of good timber. But it's very easy to push an old lady down to the ground and take one of the doors off the barn and put it on top of her like a sandwich and pile stones on it until she can't breathe any more. And that makes all the badness go away, except it doesn't, because there are other things going on and other old ladies. And when they run out, there are always old men, always strangers. There's always an outsider. And then, perhaps, one day there's always you. That's when the madness stops, when there's no one left to be mad. Do you know, Tiffany Aking, that I felt it when you kissed the winter? Anyone with an ounce of magical talent felt something. She paused and her eyes narrowed. Now she was staring at Tiffany. What did you wake up, Tiffany Aking? What rough thing opened the eyes that it had not got and wondered who you were? What have you brought upon us, Miss Tiffany Aking? What have you done? You think that... Tiffany hesitated and I said, that he is after me? She closed her eyes so that she couldn't see the accusing face and remembered the day she had kissed the winter. There had been terror and dreadful apprehension and the strange feeling of being warm while surrounded by ice and snow and... As for the kiss, well, it had been as gentle as a silk handkerchief falling on a carpet, until she had poured all of the heat of the sun into the lips of the winter and melted him into water, frost to fire, fire to frost. She had always been good with fire. Fire had always been her friend. It wasn't as if the winter had ever died. There had been other winters since, but not so bad, never so bad. And it hadn't just been a snog. She had done the right thing at the right time. It's what you did. Why had she had to why had she had to do it? Because it was her fault, because she had disobeyed Miss Treason and joined in a dance that wasn't just a dance, but the curving of the Sevet seasons and the turning of the year. And with horror she wondered, where does it end? You do one foolish thing and then one thing to put it right, and when you put it right something else goes wrong. Where did it ever stop? Mrs Proust was watching her as though fascinated. All I did was dance, said Tiffany. Mrs. Proust put a hand on her shoulder. My dear, I think you will have to dance again. Could I suggest you do something very sensible at this point, Tiffany Aching? Yeah, said Tiffany. Listen to my advice, said Mrs. Proust. I don't usually give things away, but I feel quite chipper about catching that lad who kept breaking my window, so... I'm in the mood for a good mood. There is a lady who I'm sure would be very keen to talk to you. She lives in the city, but you will never find her, no matter how hard you try. She will find you, though, in the blink of a second, and my advice is that when she does, you listen to everything she might tell you. So how do I find her? said Tiffany. You're feeling sorry for yourself and not listening, said Mrs. Proust. She will find you. You'll know it when she does, 
Oh, my word, yes. She reached into a pocket and produced a small round tin, the lid of which she flicked open with a black fingernail. The air suddenly felt prickly. Snuff, she said, offering a tin to Tiffany. Dirty habit, of course, but it clears the tubes and helps me think. She took a pinch of the brown powder, tipped it onto the back of the other hand and sniffed it up with a sound like a honk in reverse. She coughed and blinked once or twice and said, Of course, brown bogies are not to everybody's liking, but... I suppose they add to that nasty witch look, eh? Anyway, I expect they'll soon give us our dinner. They're going to feed us, said Tiffany. Oh, yeah, they're a decent bunch, although the wine last time was a bit off, in my opinion, said Mrs. Proust. But we're in prison. No, my dear, we're in police cells. And though nobody's saying it, we're locked in here for our protection. You see, everyone else is locked out. And although they sometimes act dumb, policemen can't help being clever. They know that people need witches. They need the unofficial people who understand the difference between right and wrong, and when right is wrong and when wrong is right. The world needs the people who work around the edges. They need the people who can deal with the little bumps and inconveniences and little problems. After all, we are almost all human. Almost all of the time, and almost every full moon, Captain Angua comes to me to make up a prescription for her hard pad. The snuff tin was produced again. After a while, Tiffany said, Hard pad is a disease of dogs. And werewolves, said Mrs. Prost. Uh, I thought there was something odd about her. She stays on top of it, mind you, said Mrs. Prost. She shares lodgings with Captain Carrot and doesn't bite anybody. Although, come to think about it, she possibly bites Captain Carrot, but least said, soonest mended. I'm sure you will agree, hey. Sometimes what is legal isn't what is right, and sometimes it needs a witch to tell the difference, and sometimes a copper too, if you have the right kind of copper. Clever people know this, stupid people don't, and the trouble is, stupid people can be oh so very clever, and by the way, miss, your boisterous little friends have just escaped. Yeah. Tiffany said. I know. Isn't that a shame, despite the fact that they faithfully promised the watch to stay? Mrs. Proust evidently didn't like to retain a reputation for nastiness. Tiffany cleared her throat. Well, she said, I suppose Rob anybody would tell you that there are times when promises should be kept and times when promises should be broken, and it takes a feagle to know the difference. Mrs. Proust grinned hugely. You could almost be from the city, Miss Tiffany Aching. Mm. Well, there we go. So, I remembered some point at the start of the book. That's how much we've read. That's how much we've got to go. Um, didn't they say something in the air making people dislike witches or making people feel that hatred? And remember all of that anger, all of that darkness right at the start that Terry had set us up with. And now, here's Mrs. Proust saying there's something in the air which is making people hate witches. And then they started at each other. She, Mrs. Proust even slapped Tiffany, didn't she? What's going on? The people outside were angry for a moment when that man was there. Is the man sending out the stench that makes people hate witches? I don't know. He wasn't in Tiffany's village right at the start. Or was he? If he's come along since Tiffany kissed the wintersmith. Book three of the Tiffany Egan series. Oh, it's getting a little bit interesting. There are so many questions. So many questions. Okay, so let check this next sentence out. I never, ever thought I would say this sentence. But here it comes. Ready? I won't be recording a video tomorrow night because tomorrow night I'm going out to see... A friend. Oh, I know. I know. It's one of my old mates from school. And I hadn't talked to him for years and years and years. And then the other day, he sent me a text message. All right, mate. I haven't seen you heard from you for ages. Do you fancy coming around for a drink? I'm going to go and see a friend. What is this? I'm so happy. <laughs> I hope he's, I, I, gosh, what about though if we ain't got anything to talk about? Now I've got all that to worry about, I'll just put it in there. No, we'll be all right. We'll be all right. I'll just sit down and talk. Like, like we haven't just had 30 years in between. It'll be okay, won't it? 
talk about what we've been up to. Yeah. Think about me tomorrow night, making conversation. Oh, one of my weaknesses. It doesn't seem it, does it? <laughs> I can talk to myself, apparently. <laughs> all right. Okay. I'll see you all Saturday. All right. Bye.